Um, okay, let me introduce Les. Les is, um, has been teach, teaches in sociology here at Goldsmiths. Um, he's written a number of books on sound, urbanization, race, uh, class politics, I think is probably a polite description. It's actually about what happens to working class constituencies in London through the kinds of processes that we're dealing with in this lecture series. Um, so I, th I, want, I really wanted to invite Les in, partly because I've been wanting to get him to do a lecture here for years. <laughs> I, finally, I finally made him do it. Um, but I think also because, um, for me, Les is what's best about Goldsmiths. Um, Goldsmiths is, uh, as you know, going through a number of changes because government structures and that, but it kind of stands for something very important, both in London and in the British university system, if not globally, which is the way in which we think about um, kind of national politics, city politics, and so on, on the basis of people's experiences, but also what's happening to the people who uh, have the least money, are the hardest done by, people who are in minority groups, and so on. And it seems to me that Les's work for a long time has been concerned about tracking these changes, but also advocating for uh, people who live in this area, partly as an academic study, but also, I think, as part of your general activist, activist work. And also, Les has a deep connection to, to the long history of the area. So I thought, um, as well as telling you what New Cross is historically, and what Deptford is historically, which seems to me really important because um, people are coming in from all over Britain, all over the world, and so on, and the usual experience is you come in, you do your program, you have a kind of partial, or, or of course, just very experiential uh, experience, a very experiential, um, uh, you, you live the city as it is now, you're not necessarily aware of the role that we play as people on this program, at this institution, at this moment in time, in the history of the area and its development. And we're playing that role. We're part of the gentrification development mechanism, as all universities are. Um, so I thought Les, Les would be important to tell us what we're doing in this history, um, but also because I think, uh, as I said, under the face of a number of really rapid changes in the university system, I think Les's work uh, exemplifies the best of what we do at Goldsmiths, and I thought you should hear it. Thanks, Les. Oh, I'm not sure I can follow that, to be honest with you. Yes, that, that's, a, that's, a high, that's a high bar to set. But thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I've been to s several of these talks, actually, usually given by friends and pe visitors to Goldsmiths to come and share their, their concerns with you. Um, when she asked me to do it, I thought, yeah, that would be good. Uh, I hadn't quite clocked how many of you there would be, because I've been doing these... Um, I've been experimenting with the idea of what we learn about the city when we're walking, when we're moving through it, when we're encountering it. So I've been doing lectures on foot and walking through particularly this part of London, but not only this part of London. So usually this talk is given wandering through the streets of New Cross because, as Suhel rightly says, you know, we're in a very interesting place. You can tell the post-colonial history of not only London, but of Britain, within a mile of where we sit. And so that's the, um, the, the strap line for this evening's talk, really. Of course, now, really paradoxically, I'm going to try and bring that experience into this space rather than us going out and encountering it. So marchers and steppers. Marchers. This part of London has been prone to all kinds of attempts to claim it in the name of the ordinary folk of London by racial nationalists and xenophobes. It's also been the place where those people and subjects, colonial subjects, colonial citizen subjects, fought back and demonstrated against those attempts to claim and purify the context, the space, the society. So in a way, the thing that I've always thought was so incredibly um, important and powerful and an opportunity for us doing intellectual work of any kind, really, in this context, is that we're in the middle of a, a, an urban setting which kind of embodies what I've called a metropolitan paradox. So the streets outside of where we are, the classrooms where we sit, can be the place where the reproduction of exclusive ideas and knowledge and claims can be reproduced. At the same time, the very same spaces, the very same streets can be the place where they are challenged. That paradoxical double 
struggle, if you like, a struggle which doesn't promise any set resolution. And in a way, I'm going to take us back to um, the late 1970s and 1980, 1981 particularly, and you'll see why uh, as, as the talk unfolds. But in a way, I think that history is important to remember because actually it isn't finished or over. And we're living through another moment where the, um, the power of some of those ideas about race and nation, who is the us, who is the them, are so important politically. But I wanted to start, first of all, with a short reading from one of my favourite books, Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities. I'm just going to read you a short passage. Here's Calvino. The city does not tell of its past, but contains it like the lines of a hand. Written into the corner of the streets, the gratings of the windows, the banisters of the steps, the antennae of the lightning rod, the poles of the flag, every segment marked in turn with scratches, indentations, scrolls. the lines of a hand. The past is inscribed. It's all around us, but in a, in a, in a way, is a mystery. Now, Richard Hoggart, who was the warden of Goldsmiths College, Hoggart's an interesting figure. I don't know how many of you are aware of, 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 his, of his extraordinary writing, actually. He wrote a very important book in the middle of the 20th century called Uses of Literacy, which was about what was happening to education and thinking in the era of rock and roll and consumerism a mass culture. Hogwarts was the warden here in 1981. And in his memoir, he's he, wrote, he writes a chapter about his experience at Goldsmiths. And he said the task of education should be, in his words, to intellectualise the neighbourhood. I thought, what a brilliant invitation. In the way, in, in many senses, my, the work that I've done uh, over the past 25, 30 years has been commit, committed to that project. Hoggart, very important figure in what comes to be cultural studies in Britain, uh, I think is, is, a, is, a, is a, an exemplary kind of example, if you like, of um, what it means to try, in a way, to step out of the university and engage with the world beyond it. Thirteenth of August, nineteen seventy-seven. I was fifteen years old. Didn't live in New Cross at the time, but ten miles further south. That day is an important one because we we're in the midst of a kind of moral panic about a racialized form of crime. What Stuart Hall, the person who this building is named after, would later call um, in the study of mugging called Policing the Crisis, the emergence of the beginnings of what would become the Law and Order Society. The figure of the mugger had come to symbolise, if you like, the crisis in hegemony within the wider culture and the way in which consent was managed. The National Front at the time, a white nationalist, avowedly racist organisation, decided that he, it would have a march against this new folk devil, the mugger, in New Cross on the 13th of August, 1977. And they planned to assemble here. Do you recognise where this, this is? Marquis of Granby? Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> Fantastic. That's where we are. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so here you go. If you look up there, I should have my fangled device here. I should be able to show you this. Here we are. Look. There's the library up there. There's the Marquis. What happened in, in, in the lead up to these events was a huge struggle over whether or not the National Front should be allowed to march on these streets. Prior to the march, this avowedly racist political party had had very strong intellectual, uh, sorry, very strong political um, uh, electoral support in the local area. One ward had 40% National Front and British National Movement 
um, votes in the local council election. But interestingly, after that local election, the electoral support for the National Front started to wane slightly. So in a, in a way, the National Front's um, decision to come and march in Lewisham, to march in New Cross, was a, an attempt to try and buttress that support. Do you see what I mean? They, their electoral support had started to wane a bit, so they wanted to stage this kind of political set piece in these streets. In the response to that, there was a mobilisation of local communities and national anti-racist um, uh, activists to assemble to stop the National Front from marching. So here they are, almost 5,000 of them, at the top of Clifton Rise, outside the Marquis of Granby, forcing the National Front off of the place where they came to assemble. Actually, what they, they had to do eventually was assemble in Achilles Street, which if you know where Clifton Rise is, um, literally across the street from where we are. We go, we go down to the floodplain of the Thames and there's a street that runs parallel to the New Cross Road and that's where the National Front assembled. It, was a, it wasn't a kind of, it was, a, it was a, a, a violent confrontation between the forces of racial nationalism and anti-racist um, activists. One of the things I think is so important about this event was it, it was the range of, of um, organisations that came together. Uh, you might, if you look at the back, those houses, that's really on, that's on the inside of the one-way system as you go around, opposite to where the college is. Uh, and over there, that's Gail Lewis, who became a very important figure in cultural studies and psychosocial studies, now professor of psychosocial studies, at Birkbeck College. Gail became a very important figure in the emerging black feminist um, movement uh, at this time. And she wrote, she writes brilliantly, I think, about London's post-colonial movement. She was there as part of a group um, called Wolf, Women, Women Against Racism and Fascism. And a combination of forces that come together to stop the National Party from marching. Gail commented at the time that London was like a checkerboard of social life, black and white squares. That London was a kind of deeply, on the one hand, a post-colonial, emergent and multicultural space at the same time a divide point. I've always thought that idea of the checkerboard says something very powerful and deep about the divisions that were brought in this part of London at that time. In a way, Goldsmiths, at that time, was a little bit like a white island in a post-colonial sea. Goldsmiths was very much a kind of white piece of that chicken. And yet this was unfolding literally on our doorstep. Those power blocks have now been knocked down on the floodplain of the Thames. This is looking down Clifton Rise. That's Darkest Howe standing on what was the public lavatory at the top of Clifton Rise. <coughs> There's the warden's, the warden's head, HQ. So this is literally, a, this is on top of Clifton Rise. Um, the National Front had come and was, was, was assembling below, you see it here. See that lorry grove in the top left hand? That's Patrick Harrington, actually, who became a, a leading figure in the National Front. <coughs> Along the New Cross Road, the London particular is just over there. They're extraordinary scenes. Street, if you know, if you know that part, just at the bottom of Clifton Rise. 
800. We'll be moving off in just a minute. Nick Griffin, who was the, was the leader of the, of the British National Party, said that at least 200 of those people were alive. Activists. The, the police were protecting them. Then. And also, it needed to, needs to be said and to be remembered that, you know, although the National Front were coming uh, to New Cross to protest against the mothers, in the preceding year, actually, there had been an open um, police um, <coughs> operation to crack down on so called new mothers. Come back to that, to that. So on the one hand, the police are deeply implicated in the criminalisation, particularly of like local, local young black people. The National Front come to New, to, to New Cross and to Lewisham. The events get referred to later as the Battle of Lewisham. And many felt that they had protected them that day, walking through the streets. And the photographers um, who were present that day published these images in a very uh, famous edition of Cabinet Work. <coughs> the role of photography in documentation, I think, is, is interesting in, in relation to these events. Okay. So, the reason why I'm telling you about this is partly because this is a... This is a, a, a an event of national significance in, 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 in Britain around the unfolding politics of the culture of, of race and nation. And we're just approaching this summer an anniversary of those uh, events. And so you, you, you might hear something about that. There's lots of things planned for this summer as a, mem as a, memorial, a commemoration of the, of the Battle of Lewisham. But the thing that I wanted to link it to, and why on my walk around New Cross, these things seem linked together, is that the National Front did march that day. But many in the higher ranks of, of that movement said that the back of their movement was broken in New Cross. It didn't end there, it morphed into something else. But there was an important sort of victory back then in the way. They were pushed off their course, 
they kind of didn't get to the end of the planned rally, they scuttled off. But as they walked down the new cross road, you know, past where I just showed you there, down towards the ocean, they walked past um, a house on the new cross road at number 439. Now, the, the year that I came to Goldsmiths as a student um, was in the immediate aftermath of the New Cross Fire. So the National Front had marched past this address. In the early hours of January the 18th, 1981, there was a fire, there was a house party going on, there was a fire at 439, and 13 young black people And the 14th died later, unable to live with the ghost of what the experience There were two inquiries into that um, the fire, both um, returned open verdicts. It's a crime that still hasn't been solved, it's still a mystery. People within the community have different feelings about. What happened? Many believe that uh, an incendiary device was thrown through the window and it was a racist attack. Others are skeptical. We simply don't know. But what we know absolutely, unambiguously, for certain, is the indifference that those deaths met within the wider culture of the media, within the political establishment. What was so flagrantly obvious? And you know, every day I came to college in 1981, I walked past that ruined building, which was like a kind of scar burned into the urban fabric. <coughs> what we know for sure is that those lives, as far as the white culture was concerned, didn't matter. They didn't Linton Quasi Johnson, the famous dove poet and less famous holder of a BA in sociology from Goldsmith's sociology department, <laughs> commented that 1981 was the most important year in the emergence of what would become called the Black British experience. 1981 was the most important year. And it had begun inauspiciously, according to Linton, with the fire in New Cross. But Within months, there had been a groundswell of, 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 um, of mobilisation, and this historic march started in Fordham Park at the bottom of Clifton Rise, assembled there for Black People's Day of Action. It was extraordinary, actually, unprecedented, a real moment of, 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 a, of a kind of expression of an experience and a pushback against the racist exclusionary policies of people like the National Front, but also the policing uh, practices of the metropolitan police. Now, I, I suppose I wanted, I wanted tonight just to link these events, because they're so global, actually, to us, um, and their significance, I think, is really, really important. This photograph was taken by Von Ware um, on the march. What the um, act activists, led by people like John the Rose, um, the, the writer and cultural activist and civil activist, what they decided to do was to carry the portraits of the young people who had gone above their heads. There's something about this photograph that really is haunting in the way that Avery Gordon talks about the power of, of haunting as a kind of political uh, spur or injunction. In a way, I think, what was so powerful about this image, and also that gesture, was it was an, a gesture against the indifference within the wider culture, that those lives didn't matter. I just 
want to be honest with you. I think so much of this, that moment, um, you know, people ask me, why do you write bad things if you do? <coughs> well, it didn't matter who you, what, what side of this divide. And I remember um, that summer in 1977, I knew people on both sides of that one. I knew people, you know, friends of mine whose fathers were in the National Party. And I also knew people who were ready to protest against the National Party. But the way this kind of culture quake around the politics of race and racism it wasn't something that you could stand outside of. Um, and I think in many respects, that sense of being haunted by the image of that house burned in that way. Um, it, it, it was the thing that, that, that shaped my own involvement and interest in why these things matter, why this experience matter. And it wasn't all so worthy. This shop here, Looks unique. Next to the Marcus of Granby, I, I hope you, you recognise it the next time you wander down that street, was where um, Josh Shucker, Shucker's sound system, had a culture shop and a record shop. I'm going to show you a little bit from uh, the Josh Shucker dance in a minute. You know, Shucker would basically run his sound system. And, uh, for those who don't, have, have never seen or heard a reggae sound system, we're not talking about small, you know, hi-fi here. We're talking about mountains of speakers, quad boxes, four 15-inch speakers in the quad boxes. The kind of sound that emanates from a sound system is not like any other sound I have heard. A sound that rearranged your consciousness, but also it felt like rearranged your internal organs. <laughs> So marches. On the one hand, you know, this kind of embodiment of, of a kind of politics through marching through the street. At the same time, in other squares of the city, thinking about Gary Lewis again, an alternative kind of structure of the <coughs> imagination was being established around music, dance, and body culture. And Shaka's sound system, I think, kind of embodied that. I want to try it again. Do some little magic. Do the magic. I'm sorry. I think it's so interesting to reveal when you think about the way in which the, the sort of 
demonstration, or the, or the political struggle was being embodied in the street, and then how a different historic sense of being in the world was also being embodied in the dance. The dance of the time, associated with dance, this instrumental form of reggae, which you, which you, you hear a unique way through a sound system as big as the, as the, as, as the one that Chaka had, with sirens being played, Shaka described that, the, the, the use of the sirens like throwing a, a warning into the audience. So I suppose the thing that, um, that I thought was so uh, important at the time, why I ended up wanting to write about it, was that this was a different kind of embodied politics, you know. And it was a politics that was in, in, which was hosted by young black people. And as a young white person, you could gain access to that world if you're respected. A shuffle would say, the truth no, carries no color. And the sort of dread and maxism, it's a different philosophy of the world, actually. I mean, of course, you know, this, these spheres were gendered as well. There was a kind of gendered body politic unfolding in the dance, too. But in a way, it was so important, to, to me anyway, in those days, and why I want, want to remember it now, is because that's all unfolded within the short walk of the way we are. That wasn't the only thing. <coughs> if, you go walk, if you walk out of the college and turn right, and walk 400 yards, you'll walk past Lewisham Way Youth Club. You can imagine the city, is this sort of checkerboard? Black and white space. This series of photographs made by John Gotter in 1977 was made in Lewisham Way Youth Club. I love these portraits. They seem to carry so much sort of, of that historic experience of that time. Now, John Gotter was doing a photographic pro pro uh, project in, um, in Lewisham Way Youth Club. He wanted to, to photograph the dance. But how do you photograph a dance where there's no light? There's very little light. In fact, it's all in Babylon. You know, that's, that's a more illuminated version than you, than you would experience. But what's so interesting about these portraits, I think, called Lover's Rock, collected under the name of Lover's Rock, is that they, they sort of stage and communicate so much, I think. They sort of stage sense, the historic sense of being before the camera. <coughs> okay. So you carry that on for another 200 metres down that road, past Lewisham Way Youth Club, and you come to Upper Broccoli Road. There's an obelisk there, like a military <coughs> memorial. You know? okay. So next time you go, look on the right-hand side of the street, and you'll see these shops. And where um, Goldcrest Fabrics is now was a recording studio run by Dennis Harris <coughs> at this time. And where the giant of reggae music who came and spoke recently at Goldsmiths, Dennis Bovell, was the kind of resident musical maestro and, and engineer in that studio. And what was developed in and around the studio at that time was a new version, a new kind of music, a kind of British version of reggae music that came to be known as Lover's Rock. You know, most uh, prominently celebrated by Janet Kay's huge hit in 1979, City Games. But what I want to do is I want to play you a little bit of another example of this music.
Heart in the Lovers label was written by, I think it was drawn by um, Dennis Harris in that show. So, you know, in a way, I guess I wanted to show you the sort of contiguity of how close these forms of expression are to the sort of political stage of the street and how, in a way, what I think we can find and, and, and feel within them is the trace of this complicated post-colonial history of this part of London and why it's a resource I think still to think with. And the thing that I suppose I wanted to um this might be time, but yeah. Um, I wanted also to to come back to is to try and link in a way the cultural and expressive dimensions of the, what's at stake in those musical cultures. I know Dennis Bovell when he was here and also Paul Gilroy, the cultural theorist, has also said you know, that in a way, music was so important, it mattered precisely because of the forces and the, and the sort of political pressures that bore down on the experience of that generation. Music mattered. The space of the dance mattered as an alternative public sphere to, to associate, and to socialize, to experience. Not just, you know, a safe space, but a historic sense of the world. Brown Sugar, who didn't have many other kids, um, contained Karen Wheeler, who did have a few big kids actually, you know, remember Soul to Soul, Back to Life? Yeah. A 15 year old Karen Wheeler is singing on it. So I suppose, in, in a way, I've been trying, I'm, I'm trying to link all these things um, together. Um, but also, to link this to not only the experience of racist mobilizations and political formations like the National Front and their imitators, the fascists of today, but also the actions of the state and the criminalization of communities, which restage, in a way, in the metropolis, some of the forms of colonial power that were practiced in the prison. The colony. Blue Cross becomes cast within the internal colony in this sort of racial, racial ideology. Remember I was saying at the beginning that there had been, prior to the march, a crackdown on so-called mothers. Well, this is a description by Paul Foot that was published in 1977, just before the National Front March in Lewisham. He describes a scene very close to where we are. 5.30, Monday morning. Six policemen break down the door at 21 Childeric Road, Thetford, South East London, with an axe. Another six smash down the back door. They pour inside, overturning furniture, ripping open drawers, turning people out of their beds. Christopher Foster, age 16, his frog marched into the room, in his, into the road, in his underclothes. Insults and questions are shouted at him. He and four other young people in the house are rushed to Penge Police Station. They include Kathy Cullis, a young white girl. She's stripped, that should be, to her underwear in a cell. Two policemen come and joke about the disease she's called within the black. That's the house at the bottom of Clifton Rise and 200 yards further north. Fathers are crying, crying and holding their hands. Brothers and sisters are sighing over the things that the critics 
This memorial stone, across the street, actually, from where um, that police raid happened, it is now um, there as a memorial to those young lives. You know, I do think that some of that, maybe it's just about, about being, <coughs> and being of that generation, but there is something about that that's so deeply haunting. You know, I take students down there, or, or people who are interested in this history, to, to, to walk these spaces. Um, I'm going to more or less finish now, but I, I wanted to, to, to say that, well, why did, to end by saying, well, why do <coughs> these histories matter? Why do they matter? Well, I don't think the history of racism in London or this country is over. And what is so deeply troubling, it seems to me, in the way in which the politics of race and migration, the so-called migrant crisis, is now unfolding now, is that on the one hand, it seems to me that there is a replay of some of these forms of exclusion and power. At the same time, like a scavenger ideology, racism is shifting in a sort of post-Brexit moment. And, and hopefully we might be able to talk about that. So in a, in a way, it feels like, to me, this, this particular period of, of intense of uh, political confrontation, but also of political mobilisation, is an important one to remember, not just as something that, that you know, gives us a sense of where we are, but as a political resource to go back to and reflect on now. So I'm going to finish there. I hope that's not too long. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk and also for the kind of liveness that you brought to it. Um, just even moving around, I know that the lecture is typically in, in situ, so, yeah. but yeah, it just um, really came to life with that and the documentation. Um, just to kick things off, I'm going to start kind of back at the start of the talk. Yeah. Um, and you, you said something about um, purification, I think mm. you used that term, and um, I was reading something. Um, um, I can't remember where it was, but it was talking about gentrification, urbanization, and it was talking about how um, narratives around gentrification now are about um, we must go in and, and help these poverty-stricken areas. Um, but the argument that was being made there was that a lot of that is masking over a more kind of the, the purification narrative that might have been a little bit more prevalent um, even in Victorian times with like, you know, how soap was kind of used as um, going in and kind of helping, you know, purify these kind of poor areas. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the narrative of gentrification and the ways that these words um, are, are kind of used as um, justifications uh, for certain kind of tactics. Yeah, I mean, 
it's really I, I, I'm struggling to try and keep up with a sense of, what, of what's unfolding actually yeah. I don't know if other people are but I certainly yeah. feel like the world is getting away yeah. in, in, in trying to make sense I mean I know that Lewisham Council for example and I think others do too talk about the decanting 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 okay. yeah. like yeah. you know port or yeah. <laughs> wine yeah. you take somebody from somewhere and you put them somewhere else you mm -hmm. know um, and I think some of the, some of the sort of logics of of public housing provision. I mean, estates that are being depeopled. Mm -hmm. People are being decanted somewhere else, often outside of London, sometimes as much as 50 or 100 miles, yeah. being offered public housing, you know, far out of the city. I mean, I think purification, I'm not, it comes back to, I think, the legacy of empire and race, mm -hmm. and how empire and the, and the sort of, the cultural formation of empire, mm -hmm doesn't just take place somewhere else, yeah. right? Yeah. It unfolds here, yeah. yeah? So, you know, Joseph Conrad begins mm. his journey into the heart of darkness mm. on the banks of the Thames, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just close by. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Marlow looks back on London as it's glowing, mm -hmm. you know, at <coughs> night time and says, this too is a dark place. Yeah. You know, so some of that sense of, of, you know, the darkness of the city, which is imbued with race, is also imbued with a sense of, of the poor as a dangerous presence and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. So I think that kind of, of um, uh, you know, of, of, of politics, of presence, mm -hmm. is unfolding. Uh, and, and it's why I think people like Stuart Hall, that's building his name after, is so important, because he reminds us, actually, that the, you know the impact or the or the consequences of the empire isn't something just unfolds at a distance. Mm -hmm. It unfolds in the heart of the society here, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know if this will segue into this, but the other um, thing I was I was interested in was the use of um, the figure of the mugger. Yeah. I think is how you described it, and how that particular um, story or figure. Um, was generated um, as and, and, and used to kind of justify a certain kind of um, tactic. And I was comparing that figuration with the orality that you were introducing with some of the music, um, the embodiment, um, that I think you said it, it changes your consciousness, but it also shakes your organs or something. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, maybe these tactics of something that um, is more in the realm of um, figuration, maybe around representation, maybe around opticality to some extent, at least in the imaginary, yeah. and orality as, yeah. a, as a tactic, maybe of resistance or of refiguring that. Mm. Um, well, you know, I used to think, uh, before I thought more carefully, that racism was a discourse of power that thinks with its eyes. Mm. And I think largely that is true, but it doesn't think only with its eyes. I mean, racism creates a kind of um, a structure of sensation, okay. a difference. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Difference out of place. Yes. Uh, and I think that, that there's something about that. The figure. Yes. You know, yes. racism yes. creates a gallery of figures. Dangerous presence. Mm -hmm. Dangerous presences. Mm -hmm. You know, and I wonder if the figure of the mi of the migrant is just the most current version of that yes. long historic story. You know, racism is a form of power that's like a scavenger mm -hmm. ideology that changes, that shifts, adapts, mm -hmm. that places, you know, someone problematically in the category of the us and others yeah. in the category of the them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. But I do think that, you know, some of the, the, the power of these cultural forms and mediums and modalities mm -hmm. is the way in which they operate on the senses as an effective way of being in the world, yes. you know. I think that's what's at st was, well, that's what is unfolding actually often, mm -hmm. um, and it's not one that is, you know, policed by, you know, rigid boundaries. Mm -hmm. In a way, those structures of sensation can be open. Yeah. You know, yeah. the soundproofing around culture doesn't hold, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's why, in, in many respects, I, I, I thought at the time in the early '80s, but since then, mm -hmm. you know, the the kind of cultural politics of music mm -hmm. and these, you know leisure spaces, alternative public spaces, yes. were precious because of that. Yes. Yeah. 
it's interesting. I've been thinking a lot about um, rhythm. I think I mentioned that in the first lecture that I was talking about. And um, thinking about it. Oh, you can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so rhythm. Thinking about rhythm. And um, actually, a little bit since then, I've been, think I've been thinking about um, rhythm in relation to like the rhythm of the city, the practice of the city. Um, the kind of throbbingness um, of lots of different bodies enacting this, this <laughs> yeah. space, um, comparing that with like you know the, space, the urban plan, the figure of the urban plan, and the way that that kind of is cultivating different kind of forms of life. Um, and so one of the things I was interested in is, is the the marching and the stepping yeah. um, that, that you titled this with, and and marching has a particular. Well, um, kind of rhythm suggested to it, quite militant, um, organized. Um, what about the stepping? Okay, well, yes. yeah, it's exactly <laughs> why it seems so alive to me, you know, because mm. you're absolutely right. Mm. You know, the march is a certain kind of politics in motion. Mm. And then there's the anti-march, or the counter-march, say. And, you know, uh, much of this, I think, is kind of reacting to, you know, the kind of politics of anti-fascism and fascism. You know, the, 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 the not the shadow, but the precedent of Cable Street and stop in the, they shall not pass, that kind of poli poli body politics. Yeah. So on the one hand, there's that, as a kind of embodied um, form of politics in movement and has a certain kind of rhythm. Yes. yes. But then on the other hand, there are the, 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 there's the rhythm of the dance mm. and what that brings and what that um, brings to life, yeah. actually. Yeah. You know, I, 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 maybe it's just a naive thing to, to remember, but I just remember thinking at the time, and, and th you know, cultural theorists later gave me a language, to, mm. a better language to understand it, mm. but there was a different sense of the world. Yeah. You know, it was hosted differently for a start, mm. um, but it also was furnished differently in sound mm. and embodied differently mm. in motion. Yeah. 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 And I think it seems to me that was what was so important. Mm. You know, and, and, you know, Dennis Bovell, who came, who I mentioned before, um, described this thing. He was part of a very, very pu public um, scandal, actually, of a police raid on a dance where he was, um, I think he was being prosecuted, he was prosecuted for incitement to riot or something like that. You know, it's a serious, serious case at the Old Bailey um, because he was said to have gone on the microphone and asked the the dancers, the steppers inside yeah. the dance yeah. Yeah. to stop the police taking one of the dancers away who was, you know, on suspicion of some crime. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So Dennis was prosecuted because he's alleged to have said on the mic, you know, stand firm, don't let him take it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in a way the, that, uh, what was at stake mm. was embodied around that, mm. that, but it wasn't the only case. Mm. And it brings back in that figure of the, the police um, yeah. that has been so um, prevalent in this narrative. Um, yeah. And, and um, yeah, what that police force is doing in terms of um, participating in a certain kind of violence. Yeah. Um, and that brings up another question I had about uh, violence. I mean, that was a, I don't know how you guys felt when we were watching that film, it was just so violent, really caught me. Um, and I, I actually just saw um, with the, uh, the old model, which is on at Ravens Row, and it's kind of an interesting um, uh, exhibition around the old school. Um, that's a side note, but there was a um, there was a film there that was looking at. Um, I think it was like 1968, and there had been a student. It was in Germany. A student had been killed actually on a march, um, and then there was the, there was like a huge conference, hundreds of people. They were trying to basically decide whether to go back and and hold a demonstration that would ultimately incite violence. Um, and, and I think Jürgen Habermas was coming in at the end asking questions about whether this was a, a good thing to do. Right. And I can't remember his exact phrase, but it was something like, um, th about the role of violence, can there be a progressive violence? I think that was the phrase. Um, and, and I was thinking about that phrase when I was watching this yeah. film, because to some extent you've got these two, the, you know, the, the, <coughs> I completely understand that you would need a kind of counter march here, but I was really thinking a lot about the violence there, and maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit about this and whether there is a role of progressive violence. Hmm. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, it's a big question. Um, and of course, you know, I think there was a kind of, the reason why some of these forms of open, um, unapologetic racism became <coughs> muted was because there was a kind of daily, routine, 
You know, they could be violent, mm -hmm. but it could just be ban banal. Mm -hmm. um, resistance against those forms yeah. 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 of hatred and violence, if that yes. makes any yes. sense. Yes. Um, certain things became unspeakable. Yeah. Yeah. Or not openly, they became muted, they didn't disappear. But, you know, I, I think that's what's, in, in a way, there's a kind of everyday politics. Yeah. Uh, and, and why certain kind, certain parts of the of, of the of the of the city mm -hmm. and its everyday sort of routines and conventions mm -hmm. um, shifted, yeah. Yeah. shifted. I mean, it, it, it became habitable. You know, racism didn't disappear by any means, but it, the the, sh the terms of public life yeah. did seem to have shifted. Yes, yes. Um, so maybe the display of that. Yes. Was, was not. I don't, I, we were talking about rhythm a little bit before, and yeah. I'll mention a book. Um, I think it's an extraordinary book. It's called Citizen by Claudia Rankin. I don't know if anyone here has read it, but uh, she's a poet. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's brilliant. It's yes. really brilliant. Um, and, and partly, um, I think, because it has a way of working maybe rhythmically, but also with the way that the language works to kind of get you inside of this um, headspace um, and really. Um, really get a feel for what um, it feels like um, to be subjected to everyday violence, um, in, in everyday racist violence, in these very subtle ways. So things that aren't necessarily displayed, um, but that are maybe kind of uh, yeah, hidden, but always there. Quite a sophisticated form of racism. That um, So it's interesting when, when maybe there's certain kind of displays that are disallowed when, when it's confronted, and maybe now are more, um, but, but they maybe have now become a little bit more endemic um, and even um, below the surface. But this book, um, I think, um, exposes it in a, in a way and allows us to feel it in a way, in that kind of embodied way that you're talking about. Oh, yeah, and it's a fantastic uh, reflection on the empty seat, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, the seat mm -hmm. next to her. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, yes. There's a black yes. body moving through the yes. city. Yes. You know, and I, I know lots of the students here have been thinking about how in the kind of climate of the war on terror, or how we become a, a, habituated to a certain kind of securitization. Yes. I, know, yeah. I had a, a student last year who did a fantastic project on the experience of, of young Muslims in London, yes. and exactly yes. the same kind of aversive yeah. embodied yeah. politics. Yeah. You know, the seat yeah. next to that's yeah. left vacant. Just vacant, yeah. Just vacant, yeah. or a sense of, you know, of, of being, of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That may be unspoken, mm -hmm. but is no, no, nonetheless socially alive. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe my last question, and then I'll open it up to um, discussion more widely. Um, you, you, you used a term of, um, I think you said culture quake. Yeah. And um, that there was a culture quake in the 1980s. And then you've also talked a little bit about how you know this history um, <coughs> is resonant um, yes. now. And I was wondering if, if you think um, there is this culture quake happening now, or mm -hmm. how one might identify whatever tectonic shifts need to take place to make something like that happen? Um, mm. I mean, I don't, I, I, I think, yeah, I do, I do think there is something about our moment mm. that is not the same mm. as that moment in the late 1970s, or early 80s. It's a different moment, mm. Mm. but it, I think it's part of that history unfolding yeah. in a new kind of way. Uh, and the return of a kind of melancholic nationalism, mm -hmm. you know, Paul Gilray has this wonderful formulation which he, called, which he calls post-colonial melancholia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that sense of, I remember the day after Brexit, I don't know if any of you know, you had experiences like this, but I remember turning on the telly the day after mm -hmm. Brexit, mm -hmm. and there was a, a guy being interviewed on the morning news, and he was in a motorway service station, sitting down to his English breakfast, you know, baked beans, fry breaking bar, mm. fried eggs. Mm. And the journalist said to him, I don't know what the journalist was doing in this motorway service station, perhaps they were just going up and down the country. Yeah. Yeah. Asked him how he felt about the vote. He said, oh, I'm really happy. Mm. And he turned to the camera and it was such a strange mm. thing. He said, this is my first English breakfast in England. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, <laughs> You probably stopped in that self-same service station the previous week, maybe the previous week before that, the previous week before that. You probably stopped in that place, you know, countless times. Yeah. So what's shifted? Yeah. What's shifted? Yeah. Yeah. What's shifted? Mm. You know, take our country back. From whom? Mm. Mm. From whom? Yeah. <laughs>
you know, I mean, and, and uh, you know, again, to go back to Stuart, and, uh, you know, there's, no, there's never enough opportunities to call his name. Stuart Hall wrote, or commented, that, you know, this culture lives off an unconscious reservoir of feelings about race that are the product of that colonial history. And it's partly because they're unconscious that they're about race. So that sense of well, where do these ideas come from? You know, they, 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 we, we, we're in, I don't know, certainly in sociology. I don't, I don't, I don't, so, don't know so, so much in the humanities spaces. I think it's probably more open. But we're tied to what is said in language, mm -hmm. in terms of the way we try to understand the effective power of racism in our culture and in our society. Mm -hmm. It's what's said. Mm. But I think what Stuart was very alert to was the unspoken. How to access that, and it, and it feels like to me that you know, in, in a way, you know, the explicit forms of racism have have, eva have, have kind of been evacuated from language to some degree. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they 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 get covered in other ways. Um, you know, it's not it's not racist to talk about immigration, yeah. of course. Yeah. But in a way that you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're struggling to try and find the the interpretive devices. To, to, to really understand how uh, the kind of continuing power mm -hmm. and life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of that sort of melancholic mm -hmm. post-colonial nationalism mm -hmm. has, you know, and, and of course we can talk about, well, the London factor and those white working class communities who've been left behind and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that it, that's a, that's a very complicated, I think it's a complicated argument and, and a serious project of thinking to try and make sense of that. But I do think that, that largely what we're living through is the kind of, if, if, if maybe it's not the culture quake, but the aftershock of that history constantly coming back um, and not exactly resetting the dial of, of time, but you know the, the ongoing reproduction of some of those um, historical patterns um, in our present. Yeah. yeah. Pattern, I think, is a really excellent word for that, that it is something that gets replayed in different, yeah. maybe with different faces and different... That changes, that yeah. evades, mm -hmm. that disavows, mm -hmm. that moves to a slightly different place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, to me, I, it feels like it's part of the same history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll open it up yeah, I've got a question actually. Um, it's more interesting about the idea of like the city and the building because you, you were showing us Can like some oh, part of can. London. Yeah. Oh, uh, you, were, you were showing us some part of London, um, you know, the building we see now and this idea of like a building, a body, like a memory. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not English, so it's quite interesting for me to see now that. Uh, London, as I suppose England as well, has changed in terms of like architecture. We have new buildings, perhaps made mostly by foreign architects. And so I was kind of like interested, like what's your uh, perception, like personal perception about the idea of like how the city is embodying now this new form of racism and this new, you know, the Brexit and so on. And it's like, uh, I mean, how do you feel about it? What, what do you see? What do you think? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, part one, one of the things that's really interesting, I think, is that the city is inscribed. You know, let's not talk about the city in an abstract sense. Let's talk about the street we're in. You know, mm -hmm. the physical environment is inscribed by that past. That's why I keep going back to Calvino. You know, mm -hmm. the idea that the, you know, that the, the past doesn't announce itself, but in its marks, or its inscriptions are everywhere. You know, the 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 building which the warden sits in, and which we go to meetings in, Deptford Town Hall, which is the town hall for this part um, of, of London, the borough of Deptford for a long time, is modelled on the hull of a ship. On top of that, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but on top of that building is a, a ship weather vane, the Golden Hind. You look at the figures on the front of the, of the building, they're, they're figures from the military, but there is all, you know, Walter Raleigh's up there, explorers. You know, so that imperial past is inscribed in those spaces. The River Thames, the great juggler vein of empire. 
you know, the docks that were based on the side of the, of the, of the river there were, in, in a sense, a very important part of the political economy of this part of London that linked here with elsewhere. You know, that colonial story is unfolding. They're not there anymore. They closed. Now, when we stand, we walk out of this building and we look across the, what used to be called the backfield is now called um, College Green, very grandly. <laughs> right? You look across, you know, the building, the Hoggart building, that was a school for, the, for the, the, the sons of the Royal Navy. You look across now, and what do we see at the back? We see those huge cathedrals of neoliberal commerce around Canary Wharf. It seems to me that these historic changes, these historic transformations, are there in the landscape. You know, we need the kinds of interpretive devices, I think, to think about their, the, the, the shapes, what those shapes mean and how they link to the changing patterns of culture, economy, and society. Does that just... Yeah, no, well, kind of, yeah, yeah. Just like, is this yeah, any quotation, is there no, like, gentrification, or, like, you know, like, all these buildings which have no identity somehow? Yeah, yeah. No. Well, well, we live in Catford, you know, and we, there's a new development there called Catford Green. There's no green in Catford. There used to be a dog track there some years ago, but the new development is very interesting architecturally in its, its visualisation. It contains that trace of a, certain, of a certain vision of the city, of city life, which is the gentrified one. There aren't people in the publicity, the publicity um, visualizations talking to each other. There are a few images of people on their mobile phones. But you know, yeah, I think I think these these transformations are there all around us um, to to be thought about and to be interpreted. It's partly why I think you know. What, that's a resource for us. <laughs> Thanks for the lecture. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, just, uh, I was just uh, the the two figures that you sort of like bring is the police, the national park, uh, mm. and then there's the um, the the local sort of the internal periphery, the local population. Who, all of those, those sort of three figures have kind of receded in the background now, and we're left with this university, which, um, which has always been here. So, but you didn't really talk a lot about that. Mm. That wasn't really my question, though. Okay. <laughs> of course, it would be a good question. I'm interested in knowing um, how this idea of the internal periphery, yeah. um, pretty exciting idea, um, how, how, how that idea translates from 1977 from these. Um, Children of the of the immigrants or or yeah. or the grandchildren, and uh, how does that, that translate to today? So if the, there is a process of gentrification, which is pushing new people out of London or whatever, what's happening here? What does gentrification today do? Is it still imperial? Is it uh, is, is there still an internal history? <coughs> you know, I haven't got a really good answer to that question, but I've got some hunches. I don't think that sort of remaking, the decanting of people, the, the purifying of the, of the local area for economic gain and interest that, that, that drives up the housing market is as complete, it's an uneven process. You know, I, I often go, my favourite place to go, to get something to eat at lunchtime, is Rose's Cafe on Clifton Rice. Virtually nobody from the college goes there. It's my, it's my life project to sort of increase her business and send people there. But I take visitors there all the time. She's an interesting person because she's, in a way, a product of this, this um, these uh, citizen migrants from the mid 20th century. She's in her 50s now. Um, that was her parents' experience. She's a step. She's been there a long time. Um, right opposite is a new housing development. You know, and there's something, something about the the alongsideness of those two places that's really interesting, it seems to me. Um, so I don't think it's, a, it's an uneven transformation that's happening, that's a, in a way. Um, but I haven't got a good, I haven't got a good an answer to that question. I think that's a question that really, really needs, needs serious thought and, and, and serious inquiry, actually. Because I'm not sure that gentrification, in the way that we talk about it, is, is quite as straightforward as we might imagine. Quite as straightforward. But you, your first part of your comment or your question about the role of the university, I think, is really 
important because increasingly the university is being drawn into this new vision of the city, mm. this post-industrial city, uh, vision of the city, uh, the information and culture economy. Sort of like but I've always thought, you know, why I've lo I love it here and why I've stayed here so long is that the university, on the one hand, was one of those white spaces on the checkerboard for a long time. But it also was a place unevenly and, and, and sometimes you know, not comfortably for those people who moved into this space, was offered an opportunity for a different version of things to be um, established or at least dreamt about. You know, the, the Caribbean Study Centre, which you know, is the longest standing research centre in this college, you wouldn't know that necessarily. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, announced, it is a really important place. And figures like Winston Jones. I remember in the early 1980s, they used to have a seminar series on the new crossroad in a disused shop. I saw Hazel Carvin speak there, I saw Paul Gilroy speak there, um, Winston James himself, all these people who have become really important, you know, um, theorists of the black experience internationally, presenting in this shop. And that was an extraordinary thing. Um, and, and so I think, you know, in a way, the university is both complicit with these transformations and on its best days offers a space for a different sense of the world to be thought about and reckoned with. Are there other questions? Uh, I have two questions. Um, firstly, um, around the, the history, those points to bring it up to now, yeah. to locate what you were talking about from 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. To, 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 um, one is to do with the white working class experience in yeah. the area. Yeah. So you concentrate on black history, important moments in, in black culture in this area. But it's, 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 it's racially mixed. <coughs> and a lot of the local population are white working class. Um, now, now it seems kind of more towards a rather high, kind of moving in that direction, yeah. maybe south as well. Yeah. Okay, but I was wondering what what has changed in that in the white working class um, to to get out of these kinds of histories and these kinds of oppositions. I'm thinking partly in relationship to to base culture, because uh, you're talking about the early seventies, where it basically belonged to the black black Afro Caribbean communities. Uh, and in the late 80s and 90s through house and then techno, it kind of became rape. And then in the mid 90s it became jungle and that was a point of fusion between black and white, yeah. British working class kids. Yeah. So it seemed kind of very racially mixed and not, not at all uh, organized along these lines. Mm. Uh, and now we have um, uh, upset and get tech, right? And that's also kind of very mixed, like race doesn't seem to be an issue in that, yeah. in that culture, but the inheritance of the tough tradition. That you, you have. So I'm just trying to track through the politics of white working class cultures yeah. um, since since this kind of um, a terrible period of opposition mm -hmm. um, and sort of bring that up to date. It's, it's kind of absent from this history. It's yeah. very important. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, in a way, I, I suppose I had the iconic places that I wanted to try and sort of uh, use as a vehicle to give a presentation of cultural right and the things that I really think are important. I mean, I, I actually think, you know, something like Lover's Rock, for example, can't be quite positioned or fixed in that way. And what, you know, what white working class experience becomes is in some ways hard to differentiate from that other diasporic experience too. So it's, you know, Dick Hebdige had a, fa has a fantastic formulation in his book about style where he says, you know, encoded in the aesthetics of youth styles and music, white working class subcultures he calls, is a phantom history of race relations since the war. And I actually think the things that you've been describing are, you know, the, the, the episodes in between um, this. I think, you know, the dance and bass culture and the sound system itself is such an important institution or a historic institution because, as you say, that the lasting imprint of that culture is then reproduced and reinvented within what dance music becomes through that 30 or 40 years. But also, also the sociological organisation of people who, who have the body experiences, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not racially segregated. No. It's quite important. I mean, that seems a good thing, that, that white 
white British working class and black British working class kids are kind of making the same music. Mm -hmm. and, and I was wondering, because I, I don't see that reproduced in the same way in other Western countries. Right. It doesn't, it's not happening in America no. quite the same way, if at all. Certainly not in the main, mainland Europe yeah. either. So there seems something very specific about what happens at this moment, yeah. which, because I mean, you, you kind of concentrated on the bit where the history of racism was, was, um, was in the working class, yeah. dealing with like first, second generation immigration. Um, but it's, it's like the after of that. Well, yeah, yeah, I think the, that's true. Um, but I also think there's so much uh, political and social education, you know, not yeah. the kind of you get in a lecture theatre, was happening in these places. I mean, that's, that's what my feeling about, about what was at stake, although it wasn't clear at the time. The different kinds of resources to understand your place in the world, and also to reckon with yourself, actually, in this space. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't always easy, you know, and you, and you know, to have, you have to give an account of, of oneself in that space. And what you were doing there was really, um, really important. So much, I learned so much from that experience. Um, so, my second question? Yeah, um, Just very quickly, uh, you, you mentioned at the end sort of current emergent forms of racism, uh, post Brexit and so on, but it's not as limited to Britain. There's an emerging kind of mm. boundaries from, from the state, state level and also from the populist world, yeah. rather than populism. So I was just wondering, um, I guess two moments, I, I, I guess like Theresa May's speech at the Tory party conference, yeah. like she's saying, this is, a, this is the Conservative Party's now a party in which black working class kids who are badly done by the police, we will do justice to those guys. So we're going to close the border. Right. So racism is organized quite explicitly in discourse, not about black white, but about British foreign. Yeah. And the foreigners aren't black. They don't have to no. there, There's something else now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of wondering how, I guess what can we learn from this, mm. this moment, which is an important culmination of a period of racism the transformation into another another configuration of restoration in this country mm. um, that might be instructive now in terms of what's what's the, sort of come back in a very very aggressive way. Yeah. Well, there's something I wanted to as a part of your question. I forgot about that I meant to, but you probably answered it better than I did. To be absolutely honest, with there's something as well I think about the way in which music moves in our moment where it isn't necessarily about a sensei experience of place. Not necessarily. You know, the way in which these musical forms move in an age of screens. That, that maybe is a different, I, I'm maybe not, I know I'm not the best person to make sense of that, but I think that is a, an important factor in, in terms of, well, how, does, how do those musical forms move in our time? What do they animate? Um, and, and what kind of impact do they have on the people who love them? And listen to them. I mean, that's another dimension which I think is interesting. Um, but I, I think, on the one hand, it's really important to hold on to the legacy um, and, the, and the sort of reservoir Stuart Hall puts in, uh, out of which racism is both drawn and is dr driven by, if you like. At the same time, there is a real shift, in, as you rightly say, and new hierarchies of belonging are emerging. They are emerging. And new lines of us and them are also emerging too. And it's a complicated process, politically, I think, you know, where you know, some of the alignments of the us can, you know, even in, with thinking of it in the worst possible faith, actually, or in bad faith, can assimilate difference within the us in order to castigate the them. You know. The hierarchy of belonging where it goes like this, so you get to a certain step and then, there, then. And I think that's a really difficult challenge for us, you know. So the UKIP members who are drawn from minority communities, for example, and then, de and then sort of uh, paraded as examples of we're not racist at all. You know, I think it's, it, in a way, what we're living through is a complicated moment where those, those hierarchies of belonging are being sort of reordered. but they're only, um, they are reordered, driven out of that historic experience of the impact of racism in the culture. A change in racism, the racism that shifts and moves. And that's, that, that's, that's what I think is happening. 
we're, we're a little bit over time, but really yeah, short, short question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the context of this of the memorial, like yeah. who in the end felt responsible for putting it there and when it was done, and also why this form was chosen. Mm. I, I don't know about the form, to be honest with you. What I do know is that the, the, memorial, the memorial was quite late, you know. It took a long time. I think it was on the 20, uh, 25th anniversary, it might have been, um, that, that the memorial was... was, was and, and the plaque on the house, for, for many, many years, there was no marker on the house. Um, uh, I need to find out more about, actually, how that came to be, as it is. Um, so I don't know the honest truth. But what I, I do know is that for many, many years there was no sort of public memorialisation of these events. And my hunch was that, you know, that so much, there was still so much pain experienced, you know, in all kinds of, in all parts of the, of, of the local community about these events. This unsolved crime, you know, those 14 young lives who would be my age now. So uh, I need to do more homework on that. But it's relatively recent. Great. Well, thank you very, very much, Les.